Sony Low Light Performance. I've mentioned it a lot on this channel and I'm not the only person talking about it on this platform. There have been several contenders, but for many camera reviewers, Sony still holds the crown for night shots. But how true is that across each of the product lines? In my previous showdowns, we compared a single shot taken from the exact same location on the same night using the exact same settings, but we're going to take it a little further this time. In this roundup, we'll attempt to define what it means to own each of these cameras as an astrophotographer. This is the ultimate, wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> ultimate Sony Milky Way shootout. How's that? Anyway, we're taking a look at the latest models available for each of Sony's main professional camera product lines. The entry level full frame a7 IV, the print photography focused a7R5, and the video optimized a7S III. These are the top of their line models that most professionals who use Sony will reach for. Note that you can find these same sensors available in cameras in the FX, C, and even ZV product lines, but they each come with their own compromises. So for simplicity, we'll stick to these primary models and allow you to make your own assumptions for the other models based on the findings. The a7 IV was released in October of 2021 and features a 33 megapixel full frame sensor, pretty middle of the road. At $2,500, this is the most affordable option in the lineup. The a7R5 is the newest model on the table, released in December of 2022. It features a 61 megapixel sensor, and at a price of $3,900, you pay a premium for those pixels. Lastly, the a7S III is the oldest on the roster and probably next in line for a successor to be released. This 12 megapixel shooter retails for $3,500. Just for reference, we'll also compare shots from a camera in the APS-C line, the a6500. I should mention that there is a newer model from this line, the a6700, which I do hope to test in the future. It should be said that Sony had no input on this video and that the cameras reviewed were simply borrowed from other photographers. For our tests, we will be using the Sony 24mm G lens. Now you definitely can find lenses with wider apertures and this field of view can potentially lead to problems when compared to our other tests, but I'll explain that in a moment. On the bright side, each of the cameras was able to successfully autofocus on the stars using this lens, which is pretty impressive. But even if you had to dial it in manually, it's kind of nice that the lens hood can be fitted to protect the focus ring from unintentional adjustments. Not the intended purpose, but a pretty cool feature on this lens. With the players introduced, let's jump right to the results. Each of these is a 20 second exposure captured at an aperture of 2.8, an ISO value of 3200, and a white balance of 4200K. I gotta be honest, from back here, it is way too close to call. I almost didn't expect that, especially given what we learned from the Aurora Borealis tests in my last video. So let's get a closer look. Hmm, remember how I mentioned a minute ago that the field of view could create issues? Here's the deal. 20 second exposures were fine on the 14 millimeter lens I used last summer, but this 24 millimeter lens is starting to create star streaks at this exposure length. So why would I use 20 second exposures for my test photos on this lens? There's one good reason that I'll illustrate to you in a moment, but one of the primary differences that will emerge as we compare these images will be resolution. Notice how you almost get away with this exposure length with the S model. One thing I always encourage on this channel is experimentation. The rules of astrophotography are there to help you, not constrain you. I have found many times that the exposure to focal length equations given are helpful to beginners, but not perfect. So always feel free to push the limits and find out for yourself on your camera. Showing the streaks works out for one of the points I want to make with this demonstration, but these are not shots you'd want to publish. When choosing a lens, you'll want to keep all these principles in mind. Field width, exposure time, and even sensor size. Bottom line, wider is almost always better for long exposure Milky Way shots. In a moment, I'll show you some shorter exposures to compare, but in keeping with the tradition of using 20 second exposures for these tests, we'll use these as we examine different parts of this scene. As we take a closer look at this region centered on the Lagoon Nebula, we immediately begin to understand some major differences between these cameras. First is detail. The obvious home run batter here is the a7R5, and that is no surprise at all. With nearly double the megapixel count of the next best option, the R model gets us way deeper than the rest. But what may shock you here is that the APS-C sized a6500 appears to be outperforming the full frame a7 IV for detail. How can that be? The simple answer is the crop. When using the same lens, APS-C cameras take in a smaller portion of the sky than full-frame cameras, so you're essentially getting more megapixels when cropped in this tight. And honestly, the a6500 is not doing a terrible job of capturing a comparable amount of light from the sky despite the smaller sensor size. We'll see if that remains true for other portions of the scene. At this point, it has to be said that the a7S III is producing the least amount of detail this close up, and that's to be expected when it features half the megapixel count of the next lowest in this lineup. 
But one factor that does appear to favor the S model here is noise capture. That becomes most clear in the darker parts of the Milky Way where each of the other cameras fails to produce the same level of realistic contrast. The S model doesn't produce nearly as much haze from ISO noise in these regions as the other models. It seems that at least for noise in the sky, the next best image comes from the R model, while the A6500 appears to be the noisiest overall, though I'd say not to an unusable extent. As I mentioned the significantly lower resolution of the A7S, we have to address a common accusation this camera receives, star eating. Many photographers have alleged that the smaller pixel count results in a significant and irredeemable loss of stars captured when compared to cameras with average or higher pixel counts. Now we finally get to the real reason I've been using these 20 second exposures. The star trails will actually serve as an important aid in determining the factuality of these claims. It appears that it is at least somewhat true when compared against the 61 megapixel R model, but you can obviously say the same about the A7 IV. At the risk of stating the obvious, more pixels will mean more star field detail, true for comparisons between almost any two cameras. That having been said, there is evidence of even the faintest of stars that the R model captures still present in the image produced by the S model. Now, at this resolution, is it independently distinguishable from some of the mild ISO noise? Not really. So the claims are essentially confirmed. Ultimately, I'd say the A7 IV is a noticeable leap forward from the A7S III while still a noticeable gap behind the A7R5 in terms of individual star fidelity. How much that matters, though, is entirely up to you. It probably goes without saying that there is a difference between posting to Instagram and Astrobin, and there appears to be very little overlap between those two audiences. Let's shift our focus to the foreground. Just as with the dark dust clouds in the sky, noise here can cause an image to appear to be brighter, so it's important to focus on the darker areas to better determine which cameras are giving us more of the actual data you want captured. For the sake of comparison, we'll bump up the exposure by one and a half stops for each image. Just as before, the A7S III shows a lack of resolution in the comparison, and you might even mistake it to be capturing less light than the A7 IV, but that's not the case. When you look closely at the areas where detail contrasts most strongly, like with the tufts of grass and these rocky cliff edges, the S model is giving us the best edge fidelity of the four. Even with its much higher resolution, the R model suffers from just a little too much noise to give us the honest details here. The same is true of the A7 IV, but I'd have to say to a lesser extent than the A7R5 in this case, putting it just behind the A7S for foreground fidelity. Honorable mention goes to the A6500 that while not beating the competition, is definitely punching above its weight here. All right, so as we back out, it seems that the biggest takeaways so far come down to dimensions. And once you present these images at actual scale, the differences are significant. So if you're going out to capture Milky Way photos, you have to ask yourself, what is your end goal? If it's just a post on social media, any of these cameras will do. While if it's to create prints, you might lean heavily toward the R model while choosing to skip the S model. Aside from that, the differences I'm ascribing to these cameras might feel at least somewhat pedantic at this point, but the actual purpose of these comparisons might best be demonstrated by exploring ISO. Oddly enough, ISO was once supposed to be a convention by which a universal standard for camera settings is established across all brands. As you've probably noticed, that hasn't really proven to be the case. So testing out a wide range of ISO settings for each of these cameras may help us confirm some of our observations and better understand what you could expect from each one if it was your main astrophotography camera. These are each one second exposures at an ISO value of 25,600, and I've bumped up the exposure by two stops to give us a better view. To be clear, you would virtually never use this ISO value for astrophotography. This is just for the purposes of demonstration. The first thing that you'll notice is that when these Sony cameras begin to get weighed down by noise, they seem to stray into a green territory. The A6500 and the A7R5 are really struggling, but the A7 IV and the A7S are still kind of holding up. As we get in close though, the differences get loud. The premium full-frame A7R5 is barely any better than the A6500. Impressively, even at this ridiculously high ISO, the A7 IV has maintained some fidelity of these star clusters, but nowhere near to the degree of the A7S III. The difference in noise capture between these two is undeniable. While both are a significant leap ahead of the other two, in the contest for clarity, the S model has run away with the win, and that only becomes more exaggerated when you examine the foreground a staggeringly greater amount of detail captured by the A7S III. This is in no small part thanks to this model's dual native ISO, a feature I explained in my previous video. Each of these cameras has a second native ISO, but that second low noise starting point is higher for the A7S III than it is for the others. Now in case anyone was still skeptical, these results can be replicated at any other ISO value that we'd use, whether at the limits of some of these cameras' extended ISO capabilities or at a normal range, whether photos or video. Yep, that's right, this is actual 4K video of the Milky Way. Pretty cool, huh? 
Each of these cameras has a place and purpose, but the factors that will determine that might differ depending on who you are. So let's get to some takeaways. If budget is a primary consideration, you can't go wrong with the a7 IV. It offers a better than average megapixel count while also handling ISO noise in dark scenes better than most cameras on the market. In fact, it's probably the second best low light shooter that I've ever tested. Now, if you aren't quite willing to spend the thousands of dollars attached with full frame camera ownership, there is always the APS-C option. The a6500 captures great detail for its size and the body and lenses will always be a significantly less expensive option, not to mention far more portable. It doesn't compare to the noise performance of the others, but I can tell you from experience that it's still a pretty fun and capable travel camera. We shouldn't understate the advantages afforded by a 61 megapixel sensor. Print photographers will obviously choose the a7R5, but this sensor is also the superior choice for nebula shooters. The most detailed deep sky image I ever created was captured by an R model. It just gives you so much more deep detail than anything else I've ever shot with. And that also lends itself to planetary imaging, where video is the primary means of capture. There's still very few 8K capable cameras on the market, and the a7R5 is one of them, which translates to much more detail in the final stacked images. As a bonus, I'd also mention that this camera has the most versatile articulating screen. Definitely a nice feature to have. The a7S III, famous for its low light sensitivity and noise reduction, certainly lived up to its reputation. The 12 megapixel sensor is a meaningful limitation, but there are still use cases where this camera is the superior choice. For time lapses, this may be the only camera I ever use going forward, since the images produced still equate to greater than 4K video resolution. No other camera that I've laid hands on can handle ISO values as high as this, and none of them turn dark silhouettes into visible landscapes as proficiently as the a7S III. I know a lot of you who came to this video are in the market for something new, so if this video helped you decide which camera to buy, let me know in the comments. Also, if you're someone who prefers a different brand than Sony, let me know which cameras you think I should test against these in a future shootout. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.